So, Paul, I have to admit, I'm just overwhelmed. Uh, you know, even 10 years ago, I thought we wouldn't know anything like this about planets. This is, is amazing, and it just seems to me that it's going to be hard to improve much on this. Yes, and in fact, uh, this is the gift that gives giving. There's another surprise as well. Oh. Um, remember, we were talking about what a planet would look like if it was all by itself. And you get a magnification pattern like that, and as the Earth drifts across the image plane, you get some pathetic little, very little quick clip. spike like this. Now, this is much less amplification than you get if the planet's near a star, because then you get something on the core sticks. It's much bigger signal, many more things you can measure. The other benefit of a, a planet near a star is that you see the start in increase in brightness because of the star lensing event, and therefore you can trigger all the follow-up. But nonetheless, in principle, you might be able to see something from planets that are a very long way out well, from the star. Well, you have to be pretty lucky to find one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would only be possible if there were a lot of them out there. Yes. And, curiously enough, um, no. they have been found. Not very many of them, but sort of less than ten, but here's a couple of examples. Well, less than ten. I mean, if there's ten of these, I mean, these seem like they're almost phenomenally, almost impossible to imagine they'd happen. So. So let's let's see how you know. Let's yeah. explain this first one. See so if we've got data. Uh, so this is the data of uh, many years from both the MOA and the OGL surveys. The uh, MOA gets more data with bigger error bars, and the um, OGL gets the tighter error bars but less data points. And what you can see is um, a lensing event, but it's a very small magnification, only about forty percent. And it takes what a couple of days to go across, so that's quite short. Yeah. But look at this one, another one over here. We look at that. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Whoa! Nothing, 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 nothing. <laughs> Up by a factor of 30. But only for, look, this is uh, um, one day there. So this is only happening over you know, hours. Wow, that almost seems impossible to fit. Are we absolutely sure that's microlensing? Well, I mean, the star doesn't do a lot else, does it, over many yeah. years? And it fits the microlensing shape. They had, luckily, this was up when New Zealand was observing because it's. Uh, Went up and down it's during a remarkable the night. event. And this one doesn't look like there's any way to get around it because everyone's seen it. Perfect shape. Wow. Yeah. So we have 10 events seen with these short little periods, which means they have to be little tiny things. So uh, what does that mean? What it means is you need an awful lot of planets that are not near a star. Um, and because these are so hard to see, because the, the image plane magnification is so small, you have to get very lucky for the Earth's track to go near it. So seeing even you know, seven or eight of the things that we actually see is telling us there must be huge numbers of these things out there, are probably about 1.8 for every star. So there are, these things outnumber stars. Everything yeah. else, if you're talking about maybe 30% of stars have these things, these are more than one per star. And they have to be not near the star. They have to be at least sort of out at Saturn's orbit or probably further out, maybe 30, 40 astronomical units out. Otherwise, we'd start seeing all these caustic-y things. Okay. So uh, how are we going to make these things? It strikes me as being slightly problematic from what I know of stars. Yeah, I mean, one possibility is these are outer planets, Neptunes or something like that. Um, but that far out, you might actually be able to see them by direct imaging. We're going to talk about that in the next lesson. Um, but... We don't see those things in enough numbers. So gen odds are these things really are free-floating planets. These are not even in a distant orbit around a star. They actually are drifting around the galaxy all by themselves. OK, so if we go to a place where we're going to make stars and planets, for example, the Orion Nebula, uh, one could imagine making um, a bunch of little tiny things that are, are smaller than what we call a brown dwarf. So there's this limit at about eight hundredths of the mass of the sun where you make a star, uh, and a star is defined as something that is able to fuse deuterium into helium and has an energy source. But below that, we have brown dwarfs. And thanks to infrared surveys of the sky, we now know that, you know, more or less how many brown dwarfs there are out there. And there are a lot of brown dwarfs, but they're not that many brown dwarfs. Yeah, so this would be one possibility. These things are basically small, failed stars. They form the same way a star forms. We talked about dark molecular clouds collapsing, like this one in Orion. And we know that there are stars down to, you know, maybe 20 times less than the sun, which we call these brown dwarfs. And maybe there are ones that are smaller, still formed in the same way. But as you said, the numbers don't quite seem to work out. Yeah, if we count how many stars there are, we seem to actually be going, and as you get smaller and smaller, you get fewer and fewer of them. Yeah, so... So you would have to have some little mechanism suddenly made a bunch of little ones. Yeah, so this book, if we extrapolate from the bigger ones, we can see there don't seem to be enough of these things. Yeah, okay. So maybe we need another mechanism. Another possibility is, in fact, these aren't 
failed baby stars, but in fact they are escaped planets. So you remember this planetary billiard simulation, which we've shown many times, as a way to get the uh, elliptical giants and um, to get the hot Jupiters, and maybe to get the stars going backwards, we saw from the Rostov McLaughlin effect. But if you look at the simulation, you see every now and then you lose things. Yeah. So we actually lose quite a lot if we form lots of planets like this early on. Yep, so it could be that this billiards explains both the eccentric giants and it explains these free floating ones. Most solar systems had a lot of planets and he lost a few. They got flung out and they're now wandering the galaxy poor and lonely, uh, whereas other ones um, stayed in and got warped into these orbits closer in. Well, you don't just lose a few. It sounds like we need to have a couple of these things per star. So. And that's big ones because these are, yeah, these are Jupiter these mass are things. Maybe ones. a bunch of smaller ones as well. Who knows how many little things are out running around?